Have you ever looked at your concurrency code and wondered if everything was somehow wrong? Everything? If you have, then by the end of this talk, I'm hoping that I can convince you that we have a solution. And if you haven't, then by the end of this talk, I'm hoping that I can at least convince you that something is very wrong with the way that we write concurrent code in Scala today. My name is Jetta Jashinsa, and I'm a software developer at Morgan Stanley. For the last six years, I've worked as part of a team that has built a platform that can automatically parallelize user code. Our platform is built on top of Scala, and our clients write their applications on top of our platform. These clients check in their code to our code base, and over the last decade, this has grown into one of the biggest Scala code bases in the world at over 12 million lines of Scala code. We have about 1,000 developers globally checking in code to this code base, and of those 1,000 developers, only about 100 are developers who, like me, only work on the core platform itself. The goal of the platform is to provide a framework that truly separates business logic from execution concerns. Um, so today I'm going to show you how we do that. But before I do that, I'd like to talk to you a bit about the current solutions that are available for concurrency in Scala today. So let's start by defining a monad. Um, as all of you will presumably know, a monad is like a, a container or a wrapper that abstracts away ex execution concerns. So, in theory, we love monads because they do exactly what we're trying to do. They try to abstract away execution. Um, and because we're talking about concurrency today, I'm going to focus on futures. There are a whole bunch of different types of monads, but a future wraps up some slow computation, dispatches it to another thread, and then it returns immediately. And it allows us to write asynchronous and non-blocking code. Um, so in theory, we love futures and we love monads. Um, but they invade our type system. And this is why they don't quite fit the bill when it comes to concurrency. OK, let's take a look at some code. Please pay attention, because I'm going to keep coming back to this code over the presentation. So let's say you've just started your new role at some newspaper website, and your boss asks you to write a piece of code that will tell us some metrics about visits to your page. Um, and for that, you're going to need a few pieces of data. So on line uh, two there, we're just going to get the raw hit count. This is simply number of visits to the page. On line three, we're going to get the Google count. This is the number of um, visits to the page that came through Google searches. And on line four, we're going to get the, the real hits. Um, so this is the one that actually matters. These are people who came onto the page and actually spent some time reading the article. So we're going to pass these three pieces of data to this normalize function. Um, it's going to weight them appropriately, and it's going to return us some metrics object. So this is the code you want to write to solve the problem that you've been given to solve. It's clear and concise and easy to reason about and debug. It's written in a declarative and functional style. It's expressive. It's a description of the problem that you're trying to solve and not how you're trying to solve it. Um, more than that, we've achieved encapsulation because our type signature just returns the metrics object. It doesn't leak implementation detail. And similarly, we don't rely on knowing the implementation detail of these views methods. Um, so job done, right? Well, no. Code like this in any real application is not going to fly. And that's because we've got these three sequential blocking calls, presumably to a data store. Um, all these views methods could just be uh, CPU-bound methods. Um, we've written this sequentially. So what that means, if we do have a data store that we're, we're querying, um, we've got three round trips to that data store. Um, so this very quickly becomes the bottleneck in any real application. So, OK, at this point, um, any Scala developer might look at the options available to them for achieving concurrency, um, and they might decide on futures. So uh, a future, we can wrap these views methods that are doing the I.O. in a future. Um, and so then we'll need to get at the underlying value that they represent. Um, so let's say we make that change. Now, remember, the views methods return futures. So we need a way to get at the underlying data, um, these raw values that we need. Scala provides a syntax sugar to do that. Um, there's this for comprehension, which lets you get at the underlying data there on lines three, four, and five. And then there's a yield keyword that lets you pass them into the normalized function. 
Um, so, okay, uh, we've paid the price of these two tiny keywords. Uh, we have lost a bit of the clarity that we had before because it's not really that obvious to anyone but a Scala developer that there's no loop here. Yes, there's a four, but it's four comprehension. It unwraps these features. So, okay, now you're thinking, really, job done, and it's okay. This code is still relatively expressive. Um, it's, it's a description of the problem I'm trying to solve. But then after some debugging and testing, you realize that actually there's no concurrency here at all. Um, and that's because this for comprehension is just syntax sugar over map and flat map and with filter. So actually, in line four, in order to even construct your Google stats.views future, you need to wait for the result of the page stats.views future to come back. So you've destroyed all hope of concurrency here. You've still written synchronous and blocking code. And okay, obviously this is a solvable problem. Um, we can lift up those three variables to the top of our function, and now in an attempt to name them um, appropriately, we've prefixed them with an F because now they are representing futures of these um, metrics that we wanted to get back. And then we can pass them into our full comprehension, get the underlying data in lines seven, eight, and nine, um, and then pass that finally to the normalized function. So, okay, we've achieved concurrency now. We do have concurrency. Um, these futures will be created. The execution context will handle um, executing them. And maybe now, job done. Except that to get to this point where the code runs how we want it to run, we've doubled the size of the code. Let's take a look at what we started with. This was six lines. This is 13. But more than that, we've lost the clarity that we had. And if somebody else comes along and tries to refactor by pulling uh, lines two, three, and four and just inlining them into lines seven, eight, and nine, they've again destroyed any hope that you had a concurrency. Um, so because these futures have invaded our type system, we're forced to do these kind of type acrobatics and wrangle with the code to get it to run the way that we want it to run. And this is before we've even done anything at all more sophisticated that we might want our system to do, like cache the queries to the data store, um, or batch them, um, or even run on uh, another JVM as part of a distributed system. So, um, you may think this is a fabricated example, uh, but actually this uh, was taken from open source code on the Guardian's GitHub. Um, and actually the, the developers there did a really brilliant job of keeping some of the clarity that they presumably started with when they wrote this code. Um, you can see the parallels there with the example. They've had to lift these uh, futures to the top of their function and then use the for comprehension to get at the underlying data. Um, so developers really are having to do this. And it's because execution concern has leaked into their type system. Um, a picture speaks a thousand words. So this is something that my boss's children put together for me. Um, it's a reproduction of a classic. And it sum sums up um, how developers are left feeling when they are being forced to write code like this. Because remember, back on like day one, we solved the business problem that we were asked to solve. And since then, all of the changes that we've been making have been to force it to run in the way that we want it to run. Um, okay, I'm still seeing some unconvinced faces, so maybe I'm just being melodramatic and life is not fair. We don't always get to write the code that we want to write. Um, because, you know, everything is sorted, right? We have concurrency that we wanted to have, and we're done. Um, but let's take a look again at our, at our uh, function signature here. Um, it's normalized metrics, take some article ID, and it returns metrics. And that's the crucial point. The fact that this returns a metrics mean that our function is still a blocking function. Any call to our function has to block and wait for this metric object. So this doesn't provide parallelism over many calls. Um, if I have a bunch of articles that some author has written and I map my function over those inputs, we're gonna block and wait for a metrics result at every iteration of that loop. So, okay, my function, it's self-contained concurrency, uh, but it doesn't, it is not a concurrent function. We can't scale up. Um, and other problems exist. If you've programmed with asynchronous programming frameworks, you will know that stack traces now no longer look like the um, code that we wrote. Uh, the JVM stacks don't map to the code that we actually wrote, so it becomes harder to reason about. Um, there are all sorts of invasive types now that are not just your basic types. So if you get a compiler error, it's like an essay of types that you're reading to um, deduce what's going on. Debuggability becomes harder because where do you even put the breakpoint when you don't know when anything is actually running? 
um, and composability, which I will come back to. But essentially, if my function now is returning a future of metrics rather than just a metrics, then anything that calls it is going to have to deal with that. It's not dealing with the underlying metrics type that represents our business logic. So um, maybe now I'm convincing you a bit more. Um, really, developers are frustrated, and rightly so, by having to write code that looks like this. Um, but OK, maybe we're still being melodramatic, because you could argue, let's just async everything. We've you know, got to grips with futures now, so we can wrap our whole function in a future, and now we can return a future of a metrics object. So that's all well and good. Now calls to this function will no longer block. But let's say again that we have a bunch of inputs and we want to map our function over those inputs. Um, the caller of that would like to get back a sequence of metrics. But what they're actually getting back is a sequence of futures of metrics. So OK, in the very best case, maybe they wanted to get back a future of a sequence of metrics. So then they can just unwrap and get the underlying data. But it's going to take you some time on Stack Overflow to figure out that, yes, Scala has an API to do that, the futures.sequence API. You can do that conversion. Then going back the other way is going to take you a bit more time on Stack Overflow. Um, so you're already, even in this very, very simple example, you're already doing type acrobatics to convert between these types because futures have now invaded your type system. And if future were the only monad in the world and all things were futures, then this might work. But future is not the only monad. So how do these things now compose? How do we convert from one to another? Let's say that your boss now introduces a requirement to implement a cancelable future. Um, it's not a crazy requirement. Um, maybe once you've kicked off a query, you want to be able to cancel it if you no longer need the result to free up machine resources. Um, so now you've got this cancelable future, which is in your type system. Um, but how does that play with regular futures? Um, can we assign one to the other? We're now having to write converters between these things from what was a seemingly simple requirement. And some developer on your team is going to have to figure this out. Um, and let's say that we wanted to deal with failure cases as well. So let's say that rather than a metric, we want to return a try of a metric. Um, but we're making it asynchronous, so it's a future of a try of a metric. So some caller that's passing multiple inputs and mapping our function over them is going to get a sequence of futures of tries of metrics. And they're going to want to convert that to a future of sequence of tries of metrics. Have I got that right? Is everyone still with me? If you're not, I don't blame you, um, because this is now an uncomfortable number of square brackets. Um, and doing the type acrobatics to convert between those types is just not the problem I want to solve. To, to clarify, the problem I wanted to solve, I did solve back on like slide three in six lines of code. So why am I expending this mental energy solving these like type gymnastic problems um, when I could be solving more business problems and moving on with my life. Um, and this, this problem has given rise to the use of something in Scala called free monads. Um, this is something that people who are very good at category theory and quite frankly, people who are a lot smarter than me have proposed this as a solution. Um, so these try to push all execution concerns to the edges of the program. Um, so we build up these huge data structures and we chain together our function calls. And nothing actually runs until we have an interpreter that we define for this. Um, and similar story with applicatives with effects, which tries to do something similar um, to try and cope with execution concerns in a functional way. Um, but our code base, like I said, is 12 million lines of code and growing all the time. Um, we have a thousand developers checking in code to that code base. A lot of them are coming from Java backgrounds. A lot of them are strats. They're writing the algorithms that you know, calculate risk on these financial products. They don't want to be using free monads or applicatives with effects. You don't get to a code base of 12 million lines of code if you're forcing people to write code like that. Um, or the alternative is you hire people with PhDs, but we're struggling to hire people as it is. Um, and there's another indication that something is very wrong. And that's that we have ended up with all these different types of libraries and APIs that essentially try and do the same thing. They're trying to grapple with the same problem. Um, and we reckon that if Scala developers were satisfied with the solution that had been presented to them, then they wouldn't be wasting their time writing other tasks and fibers and uh, other types of monads. They would be solving the business problems in front of them. Um, 
So really, I hope that you're agreeing with me somewhat now that developers are left feeling like this. Um, this is not the problem that I wanted to solve. This was not what I signed up for. I solved the problem back on day one and now my boss is still asking me why my PR is still in progress. Okay, so in an era where everything is multi-core, why is functional programming not winning? It has some really, really great features that make it extremely desirable in a multi-threaded environment. Immutability for one. Um, if you're guaranteed that everything is immutable, you're no longer worrying about mutable state and thread safety and everything becomes way easier to reason about. Referential transparency. If, um, so a function is referentially transparent if it's guaranteed to give back the same result every time we give it the same input. So given the same input, gives you the same output. And that is guaranteed no matter how or where or when it runs. And this immediately gives us a number of really nice side effects. Uh, we can reorder calls to these functions because it doesn't matter if we do it first or last, we're gonna get the same result. Um, we can, that lends itself to running in parallel or uh, asynchronously. Doesn't matter if I block and wait for a result to a referentially transparent function or if I run it in an asynchronous way and register a call back and get the result when it's ready. Um, that result is guaranteed to be the same. It gives us portability, which means that in a distributed system, I can run this exact same function um, on any machine in my grid of machines. It's gonna be the same result. And because of that, I can cache that result. I don't need to do any CPU execution at all, as long as I have some way to reference this call with this given input um, and then get it back out of the cache. So referential transparency, remember this one, because I'll come back to this one. Um, purity, again, if functions are pure, they have no side effects, they are very easy to reason about. So it just becomes easier to program. Composability, we want to be able to compose our functions, we want to you know, build up these bigger functions out of reusable components. Um, and we want to be able to map our higher order functions over multiple inputs. So what's not to like? Why is it that in most indexes that you look at that measure how widely used a programming language is, why is it that functional programming languages don't really come out on top? And in fact, there is one that consistently does come in the top 10. Can anyone take a guess what it is? Oh. Definitely not Haskell. <laughs> Uh, JavaScript does come in some of them. Uh, I don't think anyone said it yet. I'll come back, I'll come back and do the reveal later. Um, but we think the reason functional programming is not doing as well is because it's not the code that you want to write. So the situation that we kind of have ended up with at Scala today um, is kind of this burning platform. So people are trying to write their Scala code, they're trying to <laughs> ignore the problem, the burning problem that is concurrency. And again, thanks to my boss's children, um, I have this representation. Um, and we think that this is a bit like sitting in a burning room trying to have a nice cup of tea, but really you're getting a bit hot under the collar and it's just not a comfortable way to drink your tea. And I would know that because I am British. Um, and these theorists have provided a solution to Scala developers. Um, they've provided these free monads and these applicatives with effects, but the solution that they have provided is really like giving somebody this huge bulky fire suit and telling them to go back into the burning building. Yes, you can go back in, and yes, you can maybe pick up your cup of tea and drink it, but you're wearing these clunky monadic gloves and you've got this huge mask on your head that you can't really see or breathe out of. So yes, you can solve the problem, but you feel like a klutz. Nobody wants that when they're coding. Um, so there's been this movement to kind of go back to basics um, with Scala, but to ask to go back to basics is like asking to go back into this burning room um, without any protection at all. Um, and then there's on the other, like the other extreme, um, there's these category theorists that are pushing these solutions, but the solutions they are pushing on us require the PhDs to understand. Um, and there's seemingly no middle ground. But is there a third way? Well, at this point, I'm gonna ask you to make a choice. Time for a question. Um, red pill or blue pill? I have a volunteer um, who is gonna help me hand out these pills. Please uh, <laughs> make a choice. Um, if you have heard all that you want to hear and you kind of wanna forget what you heard, um, even if you wanna walk out of the room, I will not be insulted, you can take a blue pill um, and go back to coding as you always have known it. However, if I've convinced you that there really is a problem, um, and if you want to hear my solution, 
then take a red pill, um, and you'll see what I have to propose. Please don't take any pill if you're allergic to anything that's in chocolate, and, uh, or if you don't want to take the pill. Um, it won't really affect your enjoyment of the rest of this, but the sugar rush might actually be nice. Okay, so while the chocolate is going around, let me ask you for a moment to forget everything that you know about how we program in garbage collected languages. So let's imagine that somebody comes along and they give us a garbage collector, except that it's not wrapped up in the language. Um, this is a type intrusive garbage collector, which means that we're gonna have direct access to the garbage collector internals. So let's see what, hap what happens now when I try and allocate a new metrics object. Well, I'm not gonna get back a metrics object. I'm gonna get back an Eden pointer to that metrics object because this object was created in Eden. Um, and obviously then we're gonna need some sort of conversion if we wanted to assign A, which was an Eden pointer, to B, which has a type of gen one pointer. Um, so okay, maybe we can write those converters to do that. That's probably not impossible. Um, and we might imagine some API, some GC API that takes a sequence of some of these pointers and tells you whether they're live or not. Um, but now let's introduce arrays. So you've got to allocate the array, so there's, there's an Eden pointer, and it's a pointer to a sequence of metrics, except that those metrics are all also Eden pointers to metrics. Um, so really what I've got here is a sequence of metrics, but what I've ended up having to parse is these four types to get there. Um, this gets worse because obviously we now have these gem one pointers um, and you've got like gem one of sequence of gem one of, se of metrics. Um, and now let's say array three is actually of type gen one of array of gen one pointer of uh, metric. Um, if anyone here can you know, write the few lines of code that it takes to convert between these things, I applaud you, I definitely cannot. Um, so hopefully you can see the parallels that I'm trying to draw with futures. We very, very quickly, even in the most basic case, end up with these type acrobatics that we're being forced to do. Um, and nobody wants to write code like this. If we had been given a garbage collector that was like this, like nobody, nobody would want to use that. Um, there would be developer rebellion. Um, this is definitely not the code that you want to write. Um, there's a really good blog called What Color Is Your Function? And essentially it makes the same case that we've ended up with something akin to this for futures. So this is the lithograph edition of the picture. Um, we really are feeling frustrated at the situation that we have ended up with with concurrent code in Scala. Um, okay, so let's take a look at the programming languages and the, the runtimes that are available today. And let me ask you another question. Does C++ take care of memory management? Would anyone here argue that it does? No, but we do have um, primitives in the language itself to allocate and free memory. Um, so does that mean that C++ takes care of memory management? No, it doesn't. It means that we can build very sophisticated things like managed pointers that kind of tried to do that for us, but it doesn't mean that the language itself is taking care of concurrency. So, of uh, memory management, sorry. Um, so, another question. Does the JVM then take care of concurrency? <laughs> Definitely not, but we do have these primitives. We've got notify and wait and volatile and synchronized and all the rest. Um, and yes, we can build very complicated things on top of that to try and have uh, concurrency, but the JVM itself is not taking care of concurrency, much like C++ is not taking care of memory management just because it's given us these primitives in the language. So does anything solve for concurrency? Does anyone want to have another guess at the language that I mentioned before, the functional language that comes up, it's very widely used? Not well, no, no. Everyone recognize it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. SQL. Um, so you may not like it, but SQL is a functional language. It doesn't so much have a type system. Um, but this query here, all I'm saying is, give me all the customers who have loyalty points greater than 10,000. Um, and it's a declarative statement of the problem that I'm trying to solve. At no point here am I writing a mechanical description of how I want the database execution engine to take this query, break it up, parallelize it, deal with concurrency and locking of reads and writes to the data store, and then give me back the correct answer. Um, and if somebody on that database execution engine team 
makes a performance improvement to their algorithms and their underlying concurrency, I get a performance benefit to my query without having to change a single line of code. So yes, SQL solves for concurrency, and we think this is one of the reasons that it's proven so durable as a functional programming language. This is the code that people are writing and want to write. Okay. Um, the question really that I am asking you to think about is what is the runtime? Because really when we're programming in just about anything, we have a runtime. Um, even in, in assembly, um, your, your, kind of, your CPUs, modern CPUs, are no longer just executing one instruction per cycle. They can execute multiple instructions per cycle. And they're doing very sophisticated things to run your assembly code. So this is kind of a runtime. Um, but moving kind of further up the stack than that, when we invented functions and call stacks, then to make a function call, you're pushing things onto the call stack and you're changing the address of the function pointer. And I say you're doing that, but really it's the runtime that's doing those things for you. Um, so again, this, this function call, this call stack, this constitutes a runtime. Then moving further up the stack and further forward in the timeline of computing, operating systems come along and operating systems give you a whole lot more memory protection being one of them. You can no longer write code that messes with memory um, in some weird way and then brings down your entire operating system. And yes, you've now given up the freedom to um, access and manipulate that directly addressable memory, but I would argue that most of us don't want or need that freedom, and most of us would rather take that trade-off and gain back the protection that we get from the operating system. And then similarly, when the JVM came along, or just managed execution in general, we got um, garbage collectors, but now we lost the ability to directly be allocating and freeing our memory. Um, but again, for most developers, that trade-off is worth it, because the benefit in terms of developer productivity is huge when you can write your code and not have to reason about when an object that you allocated will be freed and whether this is now a memory leak. Um, so, much like um, all the rest of computing, uh, this really is all about trade-offs. And as you hand over stuff to the runtime, you maybe give up some freedoms. The runtime can give you a lot back. Um, so let's go back to the code that we started with, this normalized metrics function. Um, what would we want the runtime to do here? If the runtime were smarter, we would want it to take these um, three calls, presumably they're data store calls, and we would want it to batch them and send them off to the data store um, in one query rather than three. Um, or equally, if these are just CPU bound functions, we would want to make use of all the CPUs on our machine and maximize our CPU usage. So we would want the runtime to run them in parallel. And we know that it's safe to do that because we know that these are independent calls, um, but the runtime can't know that. Runtimes today do not know that. Um, so we just can't write this code that's as simple as this and then let the runtime do that. But I wouldn't be here today if there wasn't a runtime that could do this. Um, our runtime can. So let me introduce um, the node, at node. This is an annotation that we have added to the Scala language. Um, putting at node on a function is a guarantee of the referential transparency of that function. So if I, as a developer, write my function, I can code RT, it takes some input parameter P, has a return type of int. Um, if I stick at node on there, then I am guaranteeing to the runtime that this is a referentially transparent function. And what that means is that the runtime can now do all the magic that I described before um, because of this guarantee of referential transparency. Notice that the return type of this is still an int. But what actually happens is that at compile time, our um, compiler plugin kicks in um, and it transforms this code using something called Scala async into an asynchronous representation of that code, in this case, a state machine. So at compile time, we end up generating tons and tons of these state machines. And at runtime, we have a scheduler that knows how to run them, that knows how to run them concurrently, that can look for data store queries and put them in a batch. But the developer, all the developer sees is these extra five characters. Um, and one thing about referential transparency is that it turns out to be really like people gluing together bits of other referentially transparent functions. And so it becomes quite hard in an environment like this to actually write code that's not referentially transparent with. And we were worried at the very beginning that we were asking too much of our devs and that um, you know, it would be hard for them to actually get this right. Um, and we built a tool that could check that your code actually was referentially transparent. 
But we've never really needed it because no like, material problem has ever been caused by some developer not understanding how to write a referentially transparent function or marking an at node where it shouldn't have been an at node. Um, OK, at this point, I'm going to show you how it works so that you don't need to take my word for it. So here's the code that we started with. Um, take a look at that while I write a little launcher for it. So this is the point where hopefully internet won't cut out. Um, so I'm just going to write this Optimus app. If you've done any Scala before, you'll know that um, an app is just like something that has a main method. Um, we have an Optimus app, and it's going to prompt me to override the run method. Okay, um, so run is the entry point into our Optimus execution. Yep. Yes, I can. Sorry about that. Is that better? Great. Um, so I'm just going to stick an annotation on here. Um, this tells the runtime that we are entering um, graph threads. This is our managed execution. So all I'm going to do is create this class, the metrics reporter. Um, some of you may have noticed that I've got entity on there. Um, this is an addition, again, that we've added that lets us take control of class, um, class identity. Um, but creating one of these metric reporters is a bit like using a Scala apply method on a case class. Um, and now I've got a log somewhere. So let's just say log.info metrics and then stick the normalized metrics in there. And let's see how that runs. So the only change actually that is different between this and my slides is that now I have that node on here. So at compile time now, we're generating a state machine representation of this uh, method. Let me make this bigger too. Um, okay, and we're gonna make an initial uh, kind of session establishment call to the data store. Sorry, not responding right now, okay. Um, but then what we're gonna do, let me just scroll a bit. Oh, okay, I think that's, that's good enough. Um, Sorry, it's a bit laggy. Okay, let me zoom back out. Can everyone see essentially this line and this line? So what we've done without me having to make a single change except to add at node to this code that I wanted to write right at the beginning, we, the runtime, has batched together these three calls to the data store and it's made one query to the data store and come back and given us that. And if you've done any work on data storage, you will know that data storage loves batching. Often, often the performance is the same as it would be with like a single query. Um, so we didn't have to do anything. Our function still returns a metrics object. So it's still easy to write code that uses this. So let's see now how it scales up. Um, so let's write the slightly more complicated example. Let's say I'm gonna get an author out of my author database. Um, let's get the author that represents me. This is just some overload that takes primary key. And then for each article, um, in every article that the author has written, uh, we're gonna use something called the detailed metric reporter. The only real difference is that it takes the article ID. Um, and we're gonna ask it to give up its metrics. So for every article that I have written, um, we are going to call this metrics. Um, you'll see that our IDE um, can detect the node calls. That's very tiny writing there, but it says node call detected, which means that metrics itself has been annotated as a node. So let's see now how this slightly bigger example runs. Um, and what's going to happen here is that, again, at compile time for every app node, we have generated a state machine representation of that piece of code, which lets us then at runtime run it asynchronously. So while our runtime is off making a database call, um, the, the scheduler keeps the CPU busy and it creates these batches that are then ready to run for when that call comes back. So you'll see now, this, this is the first time, like there was no batching magic we could have done here to get the author. But then when we're getting back all of these stats, our batches are like in the hundreds in this example. Um, and that's without me having to change a single piece of code that I've written. I still write the code that I want to write. Um, and I can scale it up, you know, I can map over this whole bunch of articles. Um, turns out I've written many more articles. So if the internet holds out, let me just show you one more thing. Um, so 
let's say I got the author, um, author, let's actually put that there. Um, let's say that I go to the database again and I get the author again. And then let's just log again, uh, got author again. So let's see how this one runs. Uh, if it runs. Okay, give it a moment. Um, but remember, the first time that we make this call, um, we're gonna have to make a, a data store call, obviously. There is no batching we can do here. We're just trying to get one author. But then we, we log this message that we got it. But look what happens a second time. The second time you don't see any of this data store related logging. And that is because I now have this result of this query in cache. And that's because we've made our reads to the data store referentially transparent. Um, somebody gave a workshop yesterday on bitemporal data stores, which are append only. That is conceptually what we have too. So we have a very cheap way of having a fixed point in time. Um, and if we're querying the database at that fixed point in time, then the result that we get back is guaranteed to be the same. So obviously data can change over time, but at that fixed point, our result is guaranteed to be the same. So given that we have these referentially transparent uh, calls to the data store, now we can cache them. Um, so that's what happens here. That's why we don't get the whole like, bunch of logging there that you see. Okay, um, I'm glad the demo worked. So let's continue, I am almost done. Um, so the thing about the node is it is a monad. Um, you can put it in a running state, you can kick it off, you can you know, make it ready to run, you can ask for its result, you can query whether it has a result, you can query if it has an error. Um, we have cancellation uh, for our nodes. Um, we have a very functional way to do mutation and to allow change in a functional environment. Um, exception handling and like side channels into the nodes. So, at node is a node, but it's not in the type system. And that goes back to the title of my talk. We do love monads. We just do not want them invading our type system and forcing us to do these type acrobatics. Um, okay, I'm gonna end on a quote and then leave a few times, uh, a few minutes for questions. When I used to look out at this world, all I could see was its edges, its boundaries, its rules and controls, its leaders and laws. But now I see another world a different world where all things are possible. I hope that everyone got the matrix references, otherwise this is just silly. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions, and if not, I'll be outside later. Yeah, yeah go ahead. That's a great question. So the question is, what do stack traces look like? Um, my colleague Ohad is working on that at the moment. Um, we do have, we can keep track of who enqueued um, a node uh, in the state machine. So it is heavier to keep track of that link, um, but we can enable it in debugging. So we have reconstituted stack traces that let us actually line up the stack trace with your business logic control flow. Um, but yeah, without that extra like debugging, we have the same problem as any other asynchronous framework. Great question. In production, we don't. Uh, we're trying to enable at least like async profiler in production and to match up our JVM frames with what we know about our node frames. Um, but no, not yet in production. Uh, another question over here somewhere? Yeah. The very simple one? This one? Oh yeah, yeah sure. Normalized metrics, yeah. That is a great question. I'm not gonna repeat all of it, but essentially it is, can the runtime get smarter? So if you're introducing code dependencies actually into your code, like if my views method actually needed the result of the raw method, can I still be smart about kicking them off in parallel? Um, in a limited way, yes. Um, we do try to pull up as many of the independent node calls as we can to the very beginning and make them as early as possible. Um, 
We also have profiling tooling that can tell us where you've introduced a concurrency bottleneck like that because you've got a code dependency. Um, so the tooling, you know, it doesn't automate it. It tells the developer how to go and fix their problem so that they get better concurrency. Um, that's step one. Step two, which is hopefully coming once we have Loom, uh, which is JVM's own like lightweight threading model. Um, step two will be to then feed back this information that we learned from the profiler in order to inform our scheduling algorithms. Um, but really great question. In limited ways, yes, you will see that we do reordering and asynchronous execution, uh, but not that much smarter. Go ahead. That's excellent. <laughs> Yeah. Really great question. Uh, short answer is no, you can't. So the question was, how deeply do we need to um, propagate these at node annotations when we've got deeply nested function calls? Um, we have a problem today where, so all the other um, systems that I've shown you, the like, you know, fibers and tasks and all the rest, when something invades your type system, you are forced to compose the types. So you couldn't call a method that is returning a future of a metric if you're just expecting a metric. Um, we made that realization too late, <laughs> by which point this problem had proliferated. So ours does not invade your type system, which means that we can have a case where a node calls something that's just a plain def, and that then calls another node. But if you had these types, then what you would have is like future of a thing, just the thing, calling future of the thing, um, your compiler would actually just not compile. And now we've translated that into a compiler warning, uh, but it does introduce a concurrency bottleneck because although you've got asynchronous, then synchronous, then async, now your blocking point is the synchronous call. So everything beyond that, you've now serialized that thread. And this is terrible for performance if the asynchronous thing on the end is a call to the data store, for example, because now we are just waiting for that. We, we can't free up the thread to do what we want it to do, which is, maximize CPU use while we're off doing I.O. Um, again, Loom is hopefully going to be our solution. So obviously one solution is we do warn about this. Um, we have all of our compiler warnings. Um, we have a way to upgrade them to errors for people that do um, clean up their code. Um, so people can go in and fix the code. Um, but really the automated way is when we have these lightweight threads in the JVM itself, we can spin up a thread and dispatch it. Or we can spin up like a fiber or whatever they're calling it. Um, great question. Thank you. Yep. Yes, we do. Um, I don't have time because I'm out of time to show it to you, but come find me afterwards and I'll show it to you. Um, yeah, we do. Um, yeah, quickly. Getting there. Uh, we are trying to open source. We really shot ourselves in the foot by calling it Optimus Prime. You'll notice this package name. Hasbro does not like this. So we're, we're doing things like renames. Um, obviously, we're not releasing any proprietary code that is built on top of the platform, but we are releasing the platform code itself. Some code is already on GitHub. Um, I'll try and find a link later and somehow get it out. Um, but yes, we're in the process of doing it. Our end goal is that this will, we'll be able to spin up cloud containers that just have everything you need in order to run these Optimus runtimes. Um, but yeah, we're heading that way. Thanks. Yes. Um, you mean by forcing people to think about things in their type system? Yes. Oftentimes you do something to a collection of things. Yeah. In a non-FP style, because it often happens not to think about the distinction between if one of them fails, the other one can Right. Or you want to collect the whole failures. Yeah. Yes. We do, for the very common monads, um, so for options and for tries like you mentioned and for some others, we do have node try um, and we have the auto async version of an option. Um, so we do try to do that for most monads. Generally it depends if somebody is asking for it. Um, we try to make sure that we have that. Um, I'm noticing other people coming to the room but I will be outside and around. My name is Jetta. Um, thank you again for listening. Thank you.